I thank Bob for the cover, uh, but we're going to... No, he didn't, he didn't create it himself. It's by uh, um, an artist named Raphael. Is that right? Raphael. And um, we're going to see some inaccuracies in here as we talk about what actually happened on this day, what truly happened on this day. Um, that's not quite, um, the picture doesn't say it all. Did I, I didn't want it. I didn't think. I thought I said no, speaking of life. That's my fault. Sometimes, and I'll tell you why I don't always choose speaking of life. Because sometimes they're giving away everything that I'm about to say. <laughs> and so if I'm about to say it, I want to say it. And um, that's why sometimes you don't see it. So, so don't get upset. Don't think I'm ruling against uh, headquarters and... Uh, do you hear that on the tape? I'm not. It's just, just that I choose not to. All right. So today, the subject is, what does Jesus' transfiguration mean to us? So guess what today is? Sunday. Transfiguration Sunday. It's the official day on the calendar of the day uh, that Jesus was uh, transfigured. It goes into Lent. This, there's a whole sequence of things. Goes into leading up to Easter Sunday. That's why we follow that ca uh, that calendar uh, of that. So Transfiguration Sunday. Who knows what that means? And you can you can look at the picture and take a guess and be kind of wrong and kind of right. But if you read about it, you might know. Who can tell me what was Transfiguration Sunday? What happened on that day? Yes, Betty. Jesus was taken up, she said. Okay. Yes. Okay. He transfigured. Okay. All right. Well, you know what? We're going to find out. I love it. I love it when there's a little controversy. And then we find out, and that's how we walk out with knowledge, okay? That's how we walk out with knowledge. Um, you're going to find out you're right. In our Christian walk, before I get into that transfiguration, here's what Jesus said before the transfiguration took place. Here's what he said to his disciples before he took place, before that took place. Like in Matthew 16, he was talking to them and he said to them, we feel weak in our brokenness, but it is our very brokenness. This is a generalization. This, these are not the exact words. You can go back and read the exact. In, in our brokenness, that leads to finding our strength in Christ. So these opposites. Brokenness leads to strength. This, here's what he told his disciples. And Jesus tells us, in order to find him, we need to deny ourselves. So to find him, we must lose ourselves. Okay, so his disciples are looking at him. Think about it. To gain life, we need to take up with the symbol of death, the cross. In order to gain life, we take up the symbol, the cross. In order to save our lives, we need to lose our lives. And when we lose our lives for Christ, we'll find our lives. He said that to his disciples. Now remember, they're walking alongside Jesus. But you got to wonder as they look at him and say, what? Huh? But you know, they don't want to be disrespectful. Yes, master. You know, they, they, they couldn't understand it. And he kind of told them. A helper will come and help you understand. And that's why we get a lot of things today. But they didn't have that. They just had to listen. And so what was really interesting is for six days after he said that, there's nothing said about what happened. No questions asked. Nothing. I wonder what the disciples were thinking at that time for six days before what was about to take place. I wonder if there was silence. I wonder if he was scared. I wonder if they stayed away from Jesus for a little while because they heard all these things that they would have to do and maybe they weren't willing to do it. I'm guessing. I don't know. That's not doctrine. That's just me guessing. What took place for six, day, six days? I know that if I was away for six days after I heard that, I'd be thinking about what I heard. I would be thinking about it and I'd be wondering, what did he mean by that? What does that mean? So for six days after making this point, Matthew tells us the story of the transfiguration. And it takes place in Matthew 17, 
verses 1 through 9. You can also find it in Mark 9, 2 through 9, and also in Luke 9, verses 28 through 36. There are three accounts of this taking place. We are going to read the one from Matthew in the NIV, okay? This is the one we're going to read. Thank you. After six days, notice the names, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John. And that sounds like a rock group, doesn't it? Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. Let's continue. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. So our question's been answered, Betty. This is the one we're talking about, okay? Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah, talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Isn't that just like us? Okay, we want to mark this time. And, and, and Lord, let, let, me, let me put up something to say what happened here. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. We had heard that before, remember? Who remembers the last time we heard that voice and we know that it's the voice of God when Jesus was baptized. It said the same thing. He didn't say listen to him. He just said this is my son in whom I am well pleased. When the disciples heard this they fell face down to the ground terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Do you see how Jesus comes to you when you're in fear? He came and touched them and he eased their, their fear. Get up he said don't be afraid. Can you see around me, Harry? I mean, Bob. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. And here's what he says. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Could you keep that secret? Don't tell anyone what you have seen. The account of this transfiguration of Jesus as recorded is a demonstration of three witnesses. Did you notice there were three witnesses? Did you know that in the Old Testament there's supposed to be three witnesses to anything that's an event or a crime or something that takes place? They said because if there's one person, it might not be right. I'm going to use this in my classroom now. I need three witnesses to what just happened. <laughs> Not just the word of this one person. I need, it's, you find that in Deuteronomy 19.15. That you need three witnesses for that. And in all the accounts of the transfiguration of Jesus, we're given the names of the three disciples in all the accounts. Sometimes they don't do that. Sometimes they'll just say the disciples that were with him. But I think they thought it was very important to know who was there, accompanied Jesus, and who stood as human witnesses. They were the human witnesses to the glory that was Christ. Stop and think about that. They were the human witnesses to the glory. There were also three heavenly witnesses. Moses, Elijah, and God himself. And God himself. Therefore, the Old Testament law of the three witnesses was filled, fulfilled in not only earth but in heaven. It was fulfilled in both places. You talk about wanting to make something clear, yes this happened. And here are your witnesses to testify to that. The word transfigured is a very interesting word. The Greek word, and you know I don't do much Greek, but sometimes it's right in front of me and so I have to say it. So I'll tell you, so you can be very smart on Jeopardy one day, okay? But it also helps us understand what they're talking about. The Greek word is metamorpharo. Metamorph metamorpharo, yes. And the root of the word is metamorphosis. So when I think of metamorphosis, of course, I think about a caterpillar turning into um, a, chrysal a chrysalis and then turning into a butterfly. And then I think about the hawk and how he <clears throat> stretched out and became that superhuman person, uh, super not human person, monster. And it means to transform. That's what the word means. Metamorphosis, metamorphosis means to transform, literally or figuratively, to metamorphose or to change. To change. The word is a verb. It means to change into another form. It also means to change the outside. Listen to this. 
It means to change the outside to match the inside. To change, to match that, that should have some thought for you right there. It also means, the prefix meta means to change and meta, uh, morphe means form, to change form. In the case of the transfiguration of Christ, it means to match the outside with the reality of what's on the inside. We thought, you know, people thought they were dealing with a human being. But the reality of what was on the inside was what he showed. Wow. Think about that for a second. To change the outward so that it matches the inward reality. Jesus' divine nature was veiled, right? It's veiled in human form. It tells us that in Hebrews 10.20, which I didn't put up there, I don't think. In human form, and the transfiguration was a glimpse of that glory. A glimpse of that glory. Therefore, the transfiguration of Jesus Christ displayed, listen to this because I never fully understood this, displayed the Shekinah glory of God incarnate in the Son. The Shekinah glory. I had to like, do you know what Shekinah glory is? It is literally the presence, the visible presence of God. The visible presence of God, the dwelling of God. It means dwelling or it means, um, let me read my notes here, by one who dwells. Yeah, one who dwells. It means dwelling or one who dwells. And it refers to the personal presence of God. The personal presence. You hear us sing the song, Shekinah glory. New perfume. Da, 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 da. I can't think of it, but we say that word. We're saying words that we don't fully understand, but it literally means it's Shekinah glory of God. And do you know what else? That word never appears in the Bible. Shekinah glory does not appear in the Bible. They said it was a word in Hebrew that the Hebrew people, a rabbinic word, that they came up with to talk about the presence of God. Okay? So, Shekinah glory. Still a good word. Still a good word. The voice of God attesting to the truth of Jesus' sonship, and we said was the second time we heard that voice. So, Jesus, we got a glimpse. They got a glimpse of his glory. You know what? I don't think it's said that when he transfigured before them, that they fell down. They didn't fall down until God spoke. Did you notice that? When he transfigured, they were looking at them, and I don't think that they fell down so they could get, and again, it was a glimpse, because they probably would have burned up in fire if they got the fullness of the presence of God. Remember when Moses was walking by in the cleft of the rock, and he said, you can't see it all, so I'll hide you till I walk past, then you'll see the back of me. And it turned him white. As he came down, they could see the glory of God on his face. Therefore, the transfiguration of Jesus Christ was unique. It was a unique display of his divine character and a glimpse of the glory which Jesus had before he came to earth in human form. It was a glimpse of who he was. And do you know what he said at the end of uh, 16? If you go back and read it, he said, some of you will see, will experience the kingdom before they even pass on. Something like that. You will experience the kingdom. And that was before the six days. They experienced the kingdom by looking at him. And do you know what else? Is that when we talk about the glory of God, you think you have to see some bright light to see that transfiguration. But what it is actually is to look over your life the many times God has stepped into your life. Then you witness the glory of God. You have witnessed the glory of God when he has stepped in to your situation. That's the glory of God because there's so much to it. The truth is emphasized for us in the passage that the Apostle Paul wrote a letter to Philippi and he wrote it in Philippians 2 verses 5 through 11. When he wrote this, here's what he said. In your, yes, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God, but something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. 
and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even the death of the cross, as we continue. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that was above every name. That at the name of Jesus, I love saying this, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Did you hear that? And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. I did all that to get to the glory of the Father. The Son of God came to earth in the form of a man to be the true servant of God and a gift to mankind with the greatest gift being given eternal life. But did you read that part that says in heaven, on earth, and under the earth? Not yet up. The God of all. The transfiguration of Jesus was a visible sign in the presence of reliable witnesses of the reality of the power of God and the glory which is Christ Jesus. So when we, the question is asked, what was the transfiguration? I know that's a big, but if you can glean something from that. A visible sign in the presence of reliable witnesses to the reality of the power of God and the glory which is Jesus Christ. So how does this help us? So amen, but how does this help us today in our walk? What can our takeaways be? Here's one takeaway. We see more clearly that our wholeness is found in Jesus, not in our own efforts. Our wholeness is not found in our own efforts. You see um, Elijah and them try to do their own efforts. Let's make a marker here. Our wholeness is not found in our own efforts. If we read in Romans 12 verses 1 through 2, I don't think I put that up there, but it talks about be transformed by the renewing of your minds. The word indicates a great change. And in Jesus' case, the transfiguration showed his glory as part of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In the same way that Jesus fulfilled the requirements, listen to this please, because people are still stuck in this, the same way that Jesus fulfilled the requirements of the law and the hope of the prophets by revealing his glory as God the Son, so he also instills confidence in his ability to transform our brokenness and a broken humanity what he did on that mountain what can he not do for us why do we become so consumed with what's going on we are not saved or transformed by the law of the prophets Moses or Elijah we're not saved by them so do not build a monument to them Because we are not saved by the law. We're saved and transformed in Jesus. We are to listen to him, to follow him, and to be transformed in his presence. I, I, I can bet one thing. Who was it? John, James, and Peter? We're never the same. When they were in that presence and saw that happen. The transfiguration, here's another point to take away. The transfiguration shows us that death has no power. It had no power over Jesus and it, has, it had no power over Jesus. And if it has no power over Jesus, it has no power over us. And as many funerals as I have done and talked about, that is the one point that I always try to bring out. We know that when Jesus returns, there will be no more death, no more fear, no more crying. Yesterday was my mother's birthday. She would have been 98 years old. But she died in 2007. When I see her again, death has no dominion over her. And over anyone else that we've lost. We will see them again. They will be whole. They will not be sick. Some people just can't believe that. Well, what will he look like? Will he recognize me? I said, I think at that point you won't even be too worried about it. Because we're going to be transformed in the presence of God. The transfiguration revealed Jesus' true nature, the Son of God. By Moses and Elijah being present, it also showed they were not bound by the power of death. Now, wait a minute. There was no, I didn't hear about that pre-resurrection. There they sat. 
And there they talked and they weren't ghosts. There they sat. He brought them up for that. To be reliable witnesses. To speak to the law and to speak to the prophets. We're not, they were not bound by the power of death. This had to have given the disciples some measure of hope. They were like, wow. What you say is true. You are God. Do you get that measure of hope when God reveals his glory to you? When he shows you something and all of a sudden you can say, wait a minute, God, shame on me for not believing you right away. You know? That you had to show me something for me to believe you, but that's who we are in our humanness. That's the way, that's the way we walk. We believe him, but don't you believe him more when he gives you a testimony of your own? A witness to something of your own. I'm going to call it a Elijah Moses moment. That witness of your own. At the very least, they could reflect on the experience after Jesus' resurrection and put the pieces together. That was before the Holy Spirit came too. And they can go back. They were probably, the three of them got together. Well, at that point they could tell because he says, after I'm resurrected. And they say, remember what we saw? Remember what he said to us that we couldn't tell? Until we can view this experience as a glimpse of the hope and glory we share in Jesus where death will have no power over us. So that's all good, right? But how do I apply it to this week? This week when I walk out of here, when I go to work tomorrow, Sonia, when we go to work tomorrow, how do we apply it? Last week uh, when Renee talked about putting your hand, your right eye over your, your hand over your right eye, Sonia and I were walking around like this at, at school, like this. Walking around so we wouldn't pluck out our eye. But I mean, what a great visual. Thanks Renee, that was from Renee. We don't beat ourselves up, is, 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 is what, here's, here's, what, here's how it's going to apply to you, you ready? We don't beat ourselves up when negative emotions or habits raise their ugly heads. Because we all have them. We all have them. And the reason we don't beat ourselves up is while we don't excuse our behavior because we know that we're in Christ and Christ is in us and we are transformed in Christ. But it's a constant, constant, constant thing going on. You never arrive until you die. So don't beat yourself up about it, but don't walk in, 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 in failing. Don't walk in a bad attitude. Don't walk in, in expecting, well, this is how I am, and so this is always going to be the way I am. Yeah, that's pretty sad. We are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds, and that can happen. It does us good to see that in Jesus, any dichotomies we experience, the good and the bad, are brought together and transformed because it is in Jesus. It's not dependent on you as much as you'd like to think, as much as I'd like to think that the world will fall apart if I'm not here. Guess what? It won't. It'll keep going until God says it's over. As Paul tells us in his letter to Corinth, in Christ we are new. We are a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. So don't beat yourself up. The new creation needs a little brushing off. Needs a new jacket. Needs a little something new. And we get that newness from Christ. We also take away from here that our lives, when we walk out of here and as we sit here, our lives are hidden in Christ. Our lives are hidden in Christ. We can communicate with unconditional love and acceptance by the way we do not hold grudges against others that offend us. Because you know what? Your life is hidden in Christ. And there's been somebody who offended me this week. And when I read that and reread it this morning, I said, ah, that's who it's talking about. The person who offended me this week. I can't hold a grudge against you. She's my friend too. It's not you, son. <laughs> She's my friend too. But that offense came. And I was holding on to it. Like a precious jewel. Our lives are hidden in Christ. Their lives are hidden in Christ. 
either they realize it or they don't. Did you hear? On earth, in heaven, under the earth. While we don't subject ourselves to abusive treatment from others, this is important to know, right? We operate from the perspective that people are a mix of strengths and weaknesses. And somebody remind me of this when you hear me blathering about someone else. Tamar, strength and weaknesses, strength and weaknesses. It's a great reminder that we need to, the best option is to extend grace. Because that's what God does for us. Extends grace. Beautiful. Next, we're quick to comfort and encourage when others feel that their lives are too broken. Have you ever run across somebody who says, I know I'm not good enough. I know I'm completely messed up. I'm beyond redemption. My sin is just too great. We're able to say to them, not so. That's where we're able to help. Not so. That's not true. You are a precious, precious child who God came to earth for, who God lives in. All you got to do is turn around and start recognizing who he is. Because let me tell you, you can walk away from who he is and you know a million people that have done it. More than a million. Let's go with billions. Who walk away from him every day. He will not force you to turn around and recognize him unless he's really trying to get your attention. But we need to be telling others that because people are overwhelmed. People are struggling. And yeah, I begin to see that now more as a pastor when I walk alongside people and some of the darkest times of their lives. They're struggling and I'm like, all I can do is tell you what I know. All I can do is point you to the book that will tell you even more. Or give you a scripture. Let the scripture encourage you. You can do that for anybody. It does not have to be the pastor. That should be your role for somebody else. When you go to someone's home to visit. When you go to a hospital to visit someone. When someone is talking to you as you sit at these tables. When we take these bags over. Ask them what can we pray for you for. Write it down if they don't want to pray right then. Keep it in mind. Let's be quick instead of to condemn. Let's be quick to help. So, those three things comfort the broken. The transfiguration is a revelation of wholeness that is only found. Wholeness is only found in our brokenness and in Jesus Christ. When we break ourselves down, <laughs> so, okay he breaks us down and we realize it's only found in Jesus in our strengths into himself and making a new creation that's where our opposites come together our opposites come together opposites are brought together in Jesus and it's just as he fulfilled the expectations of the law and the laments of the prophets he takes the pieces of our lives praise God he takes the pieces of our lives and repurposes them for his glory. Amen? So don't be distressed if your life is in pieces. In Jesus, you're all put back together again. All put back together again. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you for the visual of the transfiguration, Lord. We thank you for the glory that was seen. And we thank you for the glory, Lord, that we see every day as you intervene in our lives. Help us to recognize it more and more and say, right there, that's it. That's the glory of God, right there. To God be the glory. That's what we mean when we say that. Lord. We just want to give you praise. We want to thank you for everything you've done in our lives and everything you're doing. And Father, help us to walk out, Lord Jesus, and just be a light of you shining out through us. That people can see the light shining out through us, which is you. It has nothing to do with us. And Lord, that you are glorified in every which way. As you renew our minds, renew our hearts. We pray it all in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.